Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 13th meeting in 2015 of the Health and Sport Committee. As usual, I would ask everyone present to switch off mobile phones as they can interfere with the sound system. I have apologies from our convener today, Duncan McNeil, who's not able to be with us. The first item on the agenda today is to take evidence from the Scottish Government on the current situation with palliative care. This is to help the committee frame its inquiry on the subject later this year. And can I welcome to the committee uh, Paul Gray, Director General Health and Social Care and Chief Executive NHS Scotland. Good morning, Paul, and Janice Burrell, Senior Policy Implementation Manager, and Professor Craig White, Division Clinical Lead, both Scottish Government. Good morning uh, to, to you all. Um, before I, I move to questions from, from members, I'm wondering, Mr Gray, if you want to make a, any opening remarks? A, a brief opening statement, convener. Thank you very much, and I uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, support the committee's interest in palliative and end-of-life care. Um, I want to start by recognising that this is a, a sensitive subject. We're talking about um, how we care for people at the end of their lives, and uh, we'll therefore treat the committee's uh, questions sensitively. And if there's anything we don't know uh, but can provide, we will certainly do so uh, as quickly as possible in order to assist the committee. I um, also want to recognise that end-of-life care is not only provided by the National Health Service, and uh, we greatly welcome the contribution of uh, partner organisations, voluntary services and others from which many have benefited, uh, and I do want to recognise that. It's a key dimension of high-quality care and services for people in Scotland who have progressive and curable uh, conditions. A review by Audit Scotland in 2008 highlighted several areas where focused action and improvement was required, and the publication in 2008 of the Living and Dying Well Action Plan provided everyone working in this area with a clear description of the changes that were required. There have been several improvements in education, national information systems, a single national policy for decision-making on resuscitation and development of a set of national indicators, these were among some of the significant developments as a result, and these were reflected in progress reports published in 2011 and 2012. We now have plans which are progressing to publish a new strategic framework, and that will guide and focus uh, us in relation to the actions that will be needed to sustain changes made and to accelerate the pace and scale of improvement where that's needed. The quality strategy measurement framework included a measure of the percentage of people spending six months at the end of life at home. These data have shown increases over time, but these increases are small. The, these data are now reported by hospital, health board and across deprivation categories, and we expect our strategic framework for action to outline the future requirements for an enhanced measurement framework. We believe this is important to support improvement. That said, um, increasing numbers of people's palliative care needs are now recognised and recorded on registers held by GP surgeries. There were 7,703 patients' uh, palliative care needs recorded in 2008-9, and this has risen to 12,050 in 2013-14. There have also been significant increases in the numbers of specialist palliative care nurses and doctors working in NHS Scotland over recent years, and we now have a single nationally agreed set of clinical guidelines for palliative care. We have learned from the successes of our national safety and person-centred improvement programmes, and we have a new advisory group in place with more effective links with GPs, hospice chief executives, nurses, palliative care specialists, and the leadership of NHS boards, local authorities, and national scrutiny and improvement organisations. Just in closing, convener, I want to mention the meeting uh, that some of us had with Kate Granger and her husband earlier this year. Um, some of you or all of you will be familiar with the Hello, My Name Is programme, which Kate uh, has set on with her husband. And she describes herself as a wife, a daughter, a sister, a friend, a doctor, and a terminally ill cancer patient. Listening to Kate and her husband speak passionately about their campaign to improve the patient experience in hospital through getting the clinician and patient introduction right was uh, hugely important to me. It was one of the most important discussions I've been part of, indeed, since I uh, took on this role. 
and I believe that it's important that we work collectively to continue to build on what we have done over the, la the past few years and to drive further, for forward, further improvement. And I welcome the committee's inquiry to that end. OK, Mr Gray, thank you very much for those opening remarks. Can we move straight to questions now? And uh, can I ask Rhoda Grant, MSP, to ask the first question? Thank you. Um, can I ask um, what pathway has now been provided for palliative care? Uh, it used to be that the Liverpool care pathway was used, and then I think because it was misused, um, people pulled back and away from that. Um, my understanding, there was a bit of a gulf then about care and treatment. Are we, do we have a recognised pathway for palliative care, and is that in use? Thank you. Uh, you're right to say that uh, we ceased the use of the Liverpool care pathway and, and, and we gave boards time to do that by the end of 2014. And in fact, um, I checked with Professor White last night to make sure that we had uh, you know, ceased that because, as you say, that, that, that there were times when it was not appropriate. Professor White will be able to give you more detail of what we have in place uh, now. I've brought um, Craig and Janice because they're the experts in this field, so uh, I will turn a number of the questions to them if that's all right with the committee. So in relation to the phasing out of the Liverpool care pathway, um, we uh, convened um, a group of clinicians to provide advice on replacements for the Liverpool care pathway, um, and the advice that we received was that um, what was needed was national guidance around care in the last days and hours of life, um, focused around four principles. Um, those principles are about informing um, and having timely and sensitive communication with people at the end of life, ensuring that significant decisions involve all aspects of the care team, that the focus is not only on physical care, but psychological, social and spiritual care, and that the well-being of relatives and carers was factored into that care planning. The decision that was taken was uh, in relation to not introducing a national uh, pathway, because one of the pieces of learning from the Liverpool Care Pathway review was the need for teams to be able to tailor their local care processes to local systems and local um, care facilities. Um, and therefore, our guidance provides a framework for uh, local boards and partner organisations to develop their own local um, approaches and we've created a, a national mechanism for organisations to share their particular resources. Um, so we have the national guidance which was published um, in December 2014 um, and through our national infrastructure we're supporting um, people to share what works well because uh, one of the problems was not being able to tailor particular care delivery to local circumstance. Can you give me an example of where it wasn't possible to tailor it to local circumstances? Uh, well, there are two <coughs> examples that, that come to mind. Uh, colleagues in NHS Grampian um, d developed a particular approach to care planning for palliative and end-of-life care, wh which they um, advised us provide, provided greater levels of flexibility and, and they were less constrained by some of the aspects of, of the pathway uh, concept. Um, also in NHS Fourth Valley, uh, the, there are some examples which, which certainly would be happy to, to pass the committee, uh, the, the work that colleagues in those two boards, and in fact all the boards have been doing uh, around the replacement, if that would be helpful. That would be helpful. I suppose my concern is that if there's not a nationally recognised standard of care, um, that we end up with the postcode lottery where um, there is an awful lot of flexibility and depending on where you live you may have excellent care at the end of life and if, you, if it is too flexible um, if circumstances don't allow or it's difficult to provide you don't get it at all um, which seems to happen quite a lot and I think my concern is if there isn't something there that says this is what people should have this is the standard of care people should have at this point in their lives um, then they may not get the care. I mean, how do you monitor, how do you check, and how do you make sure best practice is available to everybody? So the, the guidance um, and the statement that was issued in December 2014 does make it very clear in terms of what good quality care looks like, uh, looks like around the four principles um, that I mentioned. Um, and we expect NHS boards to, to use that as part of their local assurance mechanisms in terms of monitoring the, the quality of care um, through their ongoing improvement and governance mechanisms. 
So, so the monitoring around quality would be something that the local teams um, would be designing into into their processes. Okay, Mr. Gray, do you want to add something to that? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, it might be helpful uh, to Mr. Grant and to the committee to know that the the group that Professor White uh, referred to um, met twice. Uh, has met twice already in November of last year and February of this year. It will meet again on the 19th of May, on the 27th of August and on the 3rd of December this year. And one, of, uh, one aspect of the group is that it's supported by a stakeholder group that consists of representatives from third sector organisations, policymakers, senior NHS staff, frontline NHF and service users and carers. So we would expect through that group as well to get feedback on the efficacy of uh, the implementation of these guidelines that uh, Professor White has referred to. And um, I do take uh, the point that you're making on behalf of the committee that it is important that we maintain focus on ensuring that these guidelines are implemented and that there is what we're interested in here is consistency of outcome. Uh, we're, we're not imposing a, a single approach across Scotland. I mean, apart from anything else, there's clear evidence that in more remote and rural areas, the services are delivered differently and are delivered in ways which best meet the needs of the populations in these areas. So it would be wrong of us to say that what works in Glasgow should work in Rossshire, but we um, are very alert to the point that the committee is making about the need for consistency of outcome. Yes, I, I think it's quite clear that regardless of where you live, you should still have the same experience of a high quality service and support for yourself and your loved ones at that stage in your life. I suppose my concern is that there doesn't appear to be a way of monitoring that outcome and I agree that it should be on outcomes rather than how that's delivered. I mean, obviously, if you have fewer staff and people will get involved in delivering care that they may not get involved involved in delivering in a more urban area where you've got more of a breakdown of, of, of staff and resources. Um, but the person should not notice the difference. Um, they should feel supported and cared for and comfortable in their last days. And what we seem to be getting back from organisations such as Marie Curie, it depends on your very much on your condition, what kind of palliative care you get. We surely should be aspiring that everybody um, at, at end of life should have the same quality of treatment and, and care. I quite accept that, um, and uh, I mean, Professor White could perhaps say a little more about how we will assure ourselves over time that um, the, the standards are uh, being applied appropriately in, in all areas, I, uh, because I take the point entirely. So one of the um, areas in the strategic framework for action that does need some further focus conversation is how best to capture this complex aspect of care. As the committee is aware from its previous work, palliation and palliative care is a, a, a dimension of, of, of care. Um, it, it's not always a service as such, though clearly specialist palliative care um, is a service. So we, we do recognise the need to um, have discussions with, with all the various groups that, that Paul mentioned around a really quite tricky issue around how you capture a fairly complex um, set of outcomes spanning, as I mentioned earlier, quality of life, physical, social, psychological um, outcomes. In terms of the range of conditions, um, we've been doing um, a lot of work to discuss with colleagues working in areas like stroke, uh, heart failure um, and, and dementia, again, to make sure that they're included so that we can capture um, the outcomes across a wide range um, of conditions and, again, sharing some of the learning from some of the work that's been taking place. Um, but it, to, to reassure the committee, it's going to be a central element of the strategic framework that they need to really improve our ability to describe uh, that the quality of care and the consistency of care that, that's required. In terms of assurance and scrutiny, we are, um, Janice and I have had discussions with colleagues in the Care Inspectorate and with Healthcare Improvement Scotland to make sure that some of the, the standards um, and uh, the guidance that I mentioned around end-of-life care is included in the, the existing programmes around older people in acute hospitals, um, in uh, the care inspectorates working care homes. So, so again, we're, we're trying to embed this in, in a whole range of activities so that we get a comprehensive national picture uh, across different providers. OK, 
Okay, Rhoda, thank you very much. Um, can I just ask a brief follow-up question? You mentioned the care inspectorate and, uh, and care homes. So when there's a standard inspection of a care home for, for older people, uh, do you always measure? First of all, do, do you do a mapping exercise? Cause there, could there be an elderly person uh, who has not been screened as needing palliative care who is actually in that care home? So do you actually identify from the cohort in a care home whether someone has palliative care needs and whether they've been identified properly and whether they've actually been met? And do you inspect upon that? The the care inspectorate have um, very well developed resources for care homes that they issue in advance um, of the self-assessment and inspection process, which prompts them to consider all of the issues um, that you've mentioned, which, again, we'd be happy to provide the, the committee with copies of, of those documents which were developed um, after the, the Living and Dying Well recommendations. Um, the, the care inspectorate does collect data of the sort that you mentioned. Um, they particularly have focused their work in, in the past few years around whether people in care homes have an anticipatory care plan in terms of mentioning um, what their needs might be in relation to end-of-life care. Um, and we've noticed that in the data that they collect, in 2012, 38% um, of people had the anticipatory care plan. Um, and, and it is a modest increase, but nevertheless, in 2013, 46% uh, of, of people um, who, who they reviewed in, in their inspection programme in care homes uh, had an anticipatory care plan. Um, so that there's some really encouraging measurement and processes that we want to build and improve on in the future. Yeah, I think that, that's helpful. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Dennis Robertson for our next question. Uh, thank you very much, Convener, and uh, good morning. Uh, can I first of all um, say that uh, I've uh, uh, witnessed the, the um, experience of the palliative care within the Grampian, uh, especially at Roxburgh House with uh, David Carroll. And, um, it, you know, it was... a. If there had to be an example of of something working, um, can I say that that was something I felt was working extremely well, not just on behalf of the patient, but on the the family and carers uh, of the patient, and uh, also in recognising the um, the staff and their particular needs. So it was a very sort of holistic approach, and uh, I was very much impressed with the work that was going on in Grampian. However, if we're looking at the government strategy and uh, the living and dying well, it, for me, there, there, there's still a few questions that uh, I, I'm, I'm not entirely uh, convinced that we're, uh, we're making maybe as much progress as we per perhaps could be, and that is moving from the acute to the primary care sector and the integration of uh, health and social care. Do you, are we? Are you satisfied that we have the mechanism uh, there so we can measure what's happening within the primary care sector? And are we satisfied that uh, GPs and specialist nurses are identifying pe the, the patients that require palliative care uh, at the time of need rather than much later uh, down in their condition? Okay, Mr Gray, maybe first. Professor so Wright will give an initial answer. I have a couple of points to make, but I'll let Craig go first. So, um, D Dr. Carroll is a member of our national advisory group, and unlike you, we've we, um, we, we've um, we've benefited from from learning from colleagues in Grampian, and, and interestingly, um, NHS Grampian was was one of the organisations that did not use the Liverpool care. Th pathway um, and had their own um, localised approach, which is again where we've looked at, at some of the learning and, and the positive impacts that have been described. Um, in terms of integration with health and social care, as, as the committee will be aware, um, integrated joint boards are responsible for palliative care um, within hospitals and in community settings. Um, and the um, set of indicators that have been published for um, integrated joint boards in health and social care include uh, measurement around some of these issues in relation to, to palliative um, and end-of-life care uh, decisions. Um, Mr Gray mentioned the um, increase of people um, registers in palliative care registers. 
Um, I guess one of the themes in looking at some of the data are there have been increases, but they are modest around some of these um, measures. And again, if you look at the, the data from GP practices around the people with non-malignant disease, so diseases other than cancer, there are increases in the numbers of people going on to palliative care registers, but, but not the sorts of increases that we want to see as we accelerate the, the and, and increase and scale up uh, the change. So people are being identified, but not as many as we, as we would like. In terms of as many as you would like, I mean, in terms of what what can be done then to ensure that we are actually capturing those that are requiring palliative care uh, uh, come onto the register at that time of, of early need. So, so what, one of the things we've been looking at, um, I think it was captured quite nicely in a, a report by the General Medical Council in, in 2014. They, they publish uh, an annual, what they call, State of Medical Education and Practice report. And last year's report um, mentioned that end-of-life care was one of the most challenging aspects in medical practice. Um, and, and the GMC received a large number of questions from, from doctors about this area. They, they noted that even experienced doctors say that they sometimes lack support or confidence and skills needed um, to effectively communicate some of these issues. And, and we think that one of the key areas for improvement is to support not just doctors, but all members of the care team to initiate conversations with people with a wide range of, of conditions and to feel confident and supported uh, to do so. Uh, and again, education and training is going to be a, a key uh, dimension of the future future work and we believe that will improve improve things. Yeah, I just want to say, thank Mr. Green, just to add to something to that, I'll let you back in though, of course. Yeah, thank, thank you, Kavina, thank you, Mr. Robertson. Um, in relation to your question about uh, primary care, um, it's uh, worth also mentioning to the committee that uh, there is a national review of primary care out of our services, which is being led by um, Professor Sir Lewis Ritchie. Now, um, there are one of the task groups uh, for that, which is chaired by the Medical Director of NHS Tayside and co-chaired by the Royal College of Nursing Associate Director for Scotland, will explore a range of groups identified as vulnerable, including those with palliative care needs. And Sir Lewis has met the palliative care policy team in Scottish Government and attended the recent palliative care cross-party group hosted in Parliament on the 15th of March. So it was to reassure the committee that um, this issue is being taken uh, very seriously indeed. And also, just in the interests of being transparent with the committee, um, we are not here to suggest to the committee that we've got this absolutely right. You know, the reason we're doing all this is because we believe we can improve. And therefore, the assistance of the committee in this review will, will be helpful to us. Um, and we believe we're doing a lot that is good that could be spread more widely. But we also know that there is room for improvement and we just want to acknowledge that. OK, thank you. Dennis? Uh, just on that very point, uh, Mr Gray, I'm just wondering, are we able to identify um, on a national basis areas where you believe we need to improve that resource and education, whether that be in an urban or a rural type setting? Are you able then to deploy um, the appropriate resources um, a, to try and redress that balance? Well, I'll come to, to, to Professor White in a second, but um, one of the things I've been discussing with senior representatives of general practice is um, the importance of ensuring that appropriate resource is devoted to this area. And uh, I, I'm not uh, going to suggest that we have a, a complete answer to that, but I, general practice, primary care, is an absolutely central resource in palliative care. Um, a GP is very well placed to have the kind of conversation uh, with people uh, who are uh, coming towards the end of their lives with their families because the GP is, uh, generally speaking, familiar with the individual and their families. One of, the, one of the things I'd just like to draw to the committee's attention is that w one of the issues that we're trying to tackle here is the willingness of individuals and families to have these conversations at the right time. Now, that is in no sense a criticism of patients or families, in no sense at all. But we need to provide a space in which they can have that conversation comfortably. And to be frank about it, 
some people are more comfortable with that conversation than others. And it's, it's up to us. I believe we have a professional duty to ensure that that conversation can be had. And general practice is a critical part of helping us to do that. I don't know if Professor Wright wants to add anything on resource. Um, we uh, have our colleagues at NHS Education for Scotland represented on the National Advisory Group. And as part of the work to develop the strategic framework for action, we, we ha have been asking them to look at what's worked well uh, in terms of educational resources and what might be required in, in the future in order to make sure that uh, there's a range of, of educational um, programmes that, that reach a range of professions across um, different teams. Uh, highlighting um, the, the point earlier in terms of recognising that these issues span beyond cancer, um, our, our national improvement plan for stroke um, includes plans to roll out across the country some specific training resources around how best to uh, assess and provide uh, palliative care as a key dimension of care following a stroke. Um, again, that's uh, led by um, colleagues in NHS Education for Scotland. Finally, if I may, convener, um, when I, I had discussions uh, with the David Carroll in NHS Grampian, one of the things he highlighted was there are occasions when a patient and family have have uh, made the decision that the person would wish to die at home, but occasionally um, they may change their mind and wish maybe to go to a hospice uh, rather than a hospital. If that happened in the last, uh, and this was sort of intimated to me, that if it was happened in the last few days, uh, are we able to meet that request? Do you feel that we've, we've got the facility to, to then uh, accommodate the, the, the last wishes or other wishes of the patient at that time? Professor White, perhaps? So uh, one of the things we've been examining is some of the work that's being undertaken by hospices, um, it, both in relation to the way they provide advice in the out-of-hours period and uh, link with colleagues within uh, hospitals and other services where there, there is a changing situation. Um, the other uh, thing that we've uh, been uh, looking at the learning uh, from is some work around hospice at, at home. Um, and, and particularly, uh, we, we've been. It was also presented at the cross-party group uh, that uh, Mr. Gray mentioned uh, around um, work in Strathcarron Hospice and in the Ayrshire Hospice around hospice at home and that greater flexibility um, to, to change um, arrangements to deploy resource and have um, uh, people either go into to home or, or to plan f for a, a change in care setting. Um, so again, it's very much part of. Um, looking at where that's working in, in Scotland and working out why and again trying to spread that learning and, and design it into the future system. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, um, thank you, Dennis. Uh, Richard Simpson. Yes, uh, it really follows on from Dennis Robertson's uh, point about uh, where people wish to die. Um, they wish to die in different places for all sorts of reasons, I mean, in my experience. I should declare my membership of Strathcarron Hospice. I was a previous chair, founder member of the hospice, so it's an area of particular interest for me. Um, but one of the areas of concern for me in delivering hospice at home for those who wish to die at home is the provision of appropriate aids and equipment, because this is often quite short term, but the need for, um, to take it, for example, one, one area is an appropriate bed you know, which is difficult, but nevertheless, it, it can be provided. It might just be a mattress, it might be a bed, but, you know, aids and equipment, uh, it, it tends to be a rather slow process. Uh, and so the, the need for, for speed of someone wishing to die at home, um, you, you know, so I just wonder, first of all, if that's an area you're particularly looking at in terms of the supply of aids and equipment to support uh, the hospice at home concept. I think... It, it so there's, the, it, I'll come to, to colleagues in a second. There's an important point there, uh, Dr. Simpson, that, which is, which you, you know, the questioning of the committee is certainly causing me to reflect on is not only the ability to, to meet the need quickly, but also to respond quickly to a change of choice. Um, so there are both of these things coming together, um, and I think the, 
uh, the flexibility and agility with which we can respond to that is absolutely critical. But I don't know, Craig or Janice, if you want to say more about the specifics of, of, of aids and equipment, because as Dr Simpson says, it's not something that can wait a couple of weeks to be provided. So, so two, two points come to mind. Um, as, as Dr Simpson will be aware, these are often the issues that, that come up um, when GP practices are reviewing uh, things after someone has died in terms of, you know, we didn't get this on time or that this has uh, negatively impacted upon the family's care experience or, or their bereavement reaction. And so, so what we've been discussing is how we can capture the learning from across the country in, in GP practices um, and, and link that with the strategic commissioning uh, arrangements for integrated health and social care, um, where the, in the plans that the integrated joint boards will be submitting, we, we would, although we haven't um, specifically discussed um, equipment t to date, we, it's something we can flag in, uh, as important in terms of having that responsive and um, flexible provision when needs change. I think one of the advantages of integration is, as you know, sometimes it's health that have the equipment, sometimes you have uh, OT services in local authorities that have the equipment. One of the benefits of integration will be taking a look at the local provision and, and commissioning a service that can be responsive and, and change when it needs to. Just comment, that's an interesting comment because actually Forth Valley integrated its services 25 years ago, but we heard three years ago this committee was looking at health board provision and how they could, and looking at uh, efficiency savings, and Tayside told us they were about to merge their uh, equipment. So let's hope that all boards are actually going to do that. Um, I, I have another question. That is one of the principles, the four principles that are guiding you. Uh, Dr. Simpson, just before you move on, I'll, of course, we'll give you another question. We call here to supplementary on this yep. specific question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thanks very much indeed. It was very interesting talking about the, the care at home uh, aspect of it. But there are, of course, um, difficulties with certain conditions, neurological conditions, uh, Huntington's disease, something like that. that it's very difficult to do something like that uh, from home and really in terms of one-to-one -one positioning almost with a carer, nurse, whatever, to the person with the condition. And I was wondering, in terms of the neurological conditions and obviously this care from home aspect that's coming in, I take it uh, with there has to be some sort of plans to realise that it's not a one-size-fits-all and something somewhere within the plan would have to kick in to ensure that the people who this was inappropriate for, this would um, be available to those people who required it. So a key principle of um, anticipatory care planning would be that tailored individual conversation that takes account not only of the condition and, and but but the preferences of, of the person living with the condition as, and as I mentioned um, previously the, the the need to take account of the views of relatives and, and unpaid carers. In terms of when the priorities for funding um, come in, and you know, will it be some sort of acknowledgement within the funding generally when this is all being sorted out that the it won't all be placed in one area to put a pressure on others shall we say I'm trying to think of a better way of putting this but it's just with the differences in those people who definitely require a more um, focused based um, palliative care setup than perhaps others I mean, I guess it relates to, to the, the point we, we were discussing earlier in relation to uh, making sure that um, palliative care as a dimension of high quality care is something that's considered across a wide range of conditions and that we improve our ability to describe how that's being provided across a wider range of, of conditions to, to provide the sorts of assurances that would be required that for everyone who needs that, that they, they receive it when, when they need it. Okay, thanks, Colin. Uh, Richard Simpson, do you want that? I in? think uh, Paul. Oh, sorry, Mr. Sorry. Yes. It was only to, in relation to Mr. Keir's question, perhaps to um, draw the committee's attention to the primary care direct enhanced service, which came into effect here from 1st of April 2012. Now, I can provide um, as much detail as the committee wants. I wouldn't do that orally because for 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 want of time. But uh, just to give the headline. That this direct enhanced service recognises that palliative and end of life care are integral aspects of the care delivered by any health or social care professional to those living and dying from any 
advanced progressive or incurable condition. And it's not just about the last months, days and hours of a person's life, but about ensuring quality of life for patients and their families and carers at every stage of the disease process from diagnosis onwards. So that is not condition specific. That, you know, that, so if your concern, Mr Keir, is that we may fund uh, care in relation to some conditions but not others, what we're saying is through the direct enhanced service, we're looking across the range of conditions. I'm not a clinician, but I think one thing I have learned is that many people, when they're dying, they rarely just have one condition anyway. So it's you, you know there may be one um, significant presenting condition, but there will be other underlying comorbidities. So I think it is important that the package of care is tailored to the individual, and as Professor White says, and uh, we've we've provided some funding uh, for that uh, to ensure that, that, that there is progress. So thank you, convener. Okay, thank you, Mr. Reid. Did you want back in? But yes, there are just a couple of small points. One is we have 54,000 deaths a year. Have we actually done an estimate of how many would likely to qualify or need palliative care? And if not, can we do so? Because that will tell us. I mean, you've got 12,500 now on the G GP register, and that's great. And that increases, I think, as part of DES is, is, is really very worthwhile. But, you know, where, where are we actually likely to be headed for in the long term? Because that will give us a clue as to uh, what the situation is. Well, I'll come to Professor White in a second, Dr Simpson. But my, um, my reaction to that, and I, I was thinking about it yesterday um, as I was preparing for this, is that really we would want to be certain that anyone who dies in Scotland, as far as it is in, within our gift to do so, had available to them the care they needed at the end of their lives. Now, some die by accident, some die suddenly. Clearly, that can't be anticipated. But for those whose deaths we can reasonably anticipate, I would, um, without giving a hostage to fortune, I'd like to get as close to 100% as we could. I think that's what we ought to be aiming for. Now, some people may not, as I've said, want to engage in the conversation. That makes it harder. Some may not want anything. That's all right. That's a choice that individuals can make. But we should be doing our best to have the conversation with everyone, if we can. Okay. I don't know if Mike wanted any uh, supplementary. Uh, I, 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 think he, one I, th I think he did. Um, I might ask you to hold your last point because there's a stack of other committee members wishing to come in on oh, other subjects okay. rather than asking three questions. But if it's a supplementary on that, Mike? Absolutely. And I'm a wee bit disappointed uh, in Mr Gray's answer to Dr Simpson because I think this gets to the nub of the question. And it's surely possible for you to make some kind of estimate of what, you know, a reasonable assumption of what would be required so that we could all put our hands in our hearts and say that it's not patchy, as Rhoda Grant has suggested, and that the opportunity of good, high-quality palliative care is there for all who might need it. So can you put a number on that? Uh, so w one of the, the things that I mentioned earlier that, that makes it challenging is because pa pa the World Health Organization defines palliative care as um, Im improving quality of life, preventing and relieving suffering. Um, and assessing and managing care across physical, psychological, social and spiritual needs. So really that should be a dimension of, of high quality care for, for everyone. Um, I think what we we are increasingly be becoming aware of as we talk to colleagues is we, we know the numbers of people that are going to be living with dementia. We've got good data around other conditions and and linked back to the, the plans around the strategic framework, we would expect to be able to start to describe and quantify um, with some sort of measurable aims. As the committee will know from some of our other improvement programmes, you start to get improvement when you have an aim, how much by when. So we, we, we hope to start to develop aims that by X date, um, Y percent of people living with dementia, living after a stroke, will be identified as having particular needs. So, so we're absolutely committed to improving our ability to measure and, and present to, to this uh, committee and others um, something more definitive in terms of numbers of people. Um, it, it's likely to take us some further time to get that right, though, um, and, and something we're, we're keen and. and something that we do expect to be in the strategic framework for action. 
But what one of the challenges is, it's like saying, how well are we providing psychological care across the NHS? Let me try and help you then. Um, a charity wrote to me recently suggesting that 11,000 people in Scotland are suffering needlessly and that those people should be provided with palliative care and are not. that's not happening currently. Would you, would you agree with that statement? It's difficult to agree with it without seeing the detail. I, what I'm saying... So, what, well, what I'm saying uh, is that there are 54,000 people dying in Scotland. Of these, at the moment, we know that 12,700 have a plan. So there's a gap between 12,700 and 54,000. Of that 54,000, some will die suddenly, some will die by accident. There will be no opportunity for a conversation. Of that 54,000, some will die one might say, of natural causes without, without the need for such a plan. But many will, in my view, ought to be placed in the position of having that conversation. So to answer your question, I want to get as close as is reasonably possible to the 54,000. Thank you. Um, I'll be a little bit naughty here after denying Dr Simpson a, 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 another question, but it was on the numbers that, that my question was going to be on, Mike, so just bear, bear with me briefly. Um, there has to surely some modelling work around that. I think Mike makes a reasonable point. The problem is he could have said 15,000, he could have said 8,000, he could have picked any number. Unless the Scottish Government has suitable modelling work, we can all just pick a number. So earlier on you gave a figure I think what you said, 7,703 7, people had registered pa palliative care needs in 2008 9 I think it was, and it went up to 12,050 in 2013-14. Do you know, for example, is that just because we're getting better with an existing cohort who needed palliative care anyway, or we've got an ageing population and more complex illnesses developing, so the burden is becoming greater also? So... Why is there that increase and where should that number rest at? Um, and, and, and more importantly, the modelling work that sits behind that, is the Scottish Government doing that modelling work or are we leaving it to the, the new integration boards? Who's pulling it together? And I'm being really naughty, a fourth question now, Richard. That all has to, that, that also has to push into strategic commissioning because actually this is about individual human beings getting the services they need at the time they need them. So I don't want to have a discussion about arguing about the numbers. The reassurance I want is that you're getting a grip on the numbers and that will feed its way into local strategic commissioning. So I'll say yes and then I'll let... Uh, no, genuinely. I mean, absolutely fair point. It has to come in. If the integrated joint boards are responsible, it has to come into their commissioning plans. Entirely agree with that. And I will also say yes to the fact that we need to understand this nationally. We can't, although there is local delegation in terms of the delivery, we need to understand it nationally. But Professor White will say a bit more. Um, uh, Professor Scott Murray at the University of Edinburgh has been undertaking some analysis around those figures in relation to uh, the change in the palliative care registers, particularly around the conditions that people are living with. Um, we have some um, historical data from the Direct Enhanced Service that, that um, Paul mentioned and some data I believe that's about to be published uh, which we would hope would influence uh, the, the further conversations around how to, to make improvements. Going back to Mr Mackenzie's related point, the the key point is we want all the care processes in Scotland to identify need at, at the point that the need emerges and I, and I think there's a, a, a real need to um, set some challenging uh, improvement aims around that. We've got some good mechanisms of, of identifying need um, and, and some good work. But again, the, the, the measurement framework that needs to be in place has to set some bold aims around uh, increasing the numbers of people that have a conversation and have their needs documented early on uh, following diagnosis. Now, now this is a, a, I wouldn't push it any further other than to say this is a scoping exercise for a future inquiry we're going to have later on in the year. If myself or one of my colleagues was to ask a similar question later on in the year, would you think you'd be in a position to say, well, in this health board area or in that integrated joint board, uh, here is the modelling work that is being done currently to say we need to have 
X more beds in hospices. We have to have Y more uh, beds in care homes. We have to have Z more uh, specialist uh, professionals in this area. When do the numbers feed itself into structural change? I'm not asking you to answer that question just now. It's a scoping exercise. Do you think you're going to be in a position to answer those types of questions as our inquiry rolls out? Um, we have data currently around uh, the um, partnerships and variation in some of the figures in terms of numbers of um, bed days um, at the end of life. So the, the data framework that's in place to support integration w would be able to answer some of those questions. In terms of the other issues, um, we, we are gathering examples of, for example, the, the, the financial resources, the save bed days from hospice at home services, um, from teams that are looking at um, identifying palliative care needs in people living with liver disease. So there are disparate sources of data that we are starting to bring together precisely because we realise that we need to try and improve uh, our ability to describe the national picture. Okay, I, I, I thank you for that, uh, Nanette. Thank you. Um, I noticed the, the, one of the priorities for implementation in the progress report on, on, on the strategy is the electronic palliative care summary. Um, what progress has been made in ensuring that existing um, electronic systems, uh, particularly the key information system, uh, are able to effectively communicate a patient's end-of-life care goals and, and information in a way that supports their care in all acute and community settings? And what plans, if any, are in place to ensure that the, the summary, key information summary system can cope with the increasing clinical complexity of communicating advanced care planning decisions, especially in emergency situations? Can I say, Dr Norman, this is, this is an important point. Um, I'd like if the committee was content to write to you about that, because I asked yesterday for um, some more information on what we were doing. I had a, a cause to uh, engage with someone recently over the availability of the key information sum summary to the ambulance service, which I know is planned uh, and is being rolled out this year. But that prompted me to ask for some wider briefing on uh, progress on e-health uh, in this area. So if it was helpful to the committee, rather than give you a patchy answer, I'd, I'd like to write to the committee about that. I mean, I'd be happy with that because it has been specifically raised with me by your palliative care organisation, and I'd really be quite interested and, to know. And in terms of timing, convener, when would it be helpful to the committee to have that advice? Um, well, I'm actually going to turn to uh, our clerks. I'm not sure when the timetable for our inquiry is going to, going to roll out. OK, I think it would be helpful if we had it by the summer recess. So we'll, we'll, we'll get to it before summer recess then. Uh, that, that would be fine. So it'll be the end, end of June. Okay. Thank okay. you. Uh, Thanks, I might have another question later on, but we'll see how it goes. Thank okay. You. Uh, Richard Lyle. Thank you, Nina. Um, good morning. One of the problems um, with your, your patchy data, and again, is the fact that we've all had a situation where uh, friends, relations, etc., have been diagnosed with cancer. Um, but, uh, you know, just walk into the doctor for a normal, they think, a normal routine. Um, uh, discussion and then find out they've uh, with the uh, later tests they have cancer. Is that one of the problems that you're finding that you know to try and identify sections of, of where people are, are having uh, this condition? Well, of course, um, uh, that's one of the issues that when when a person approaches a GP or another qualified clinician uh, with with a, a a presenting issue, it, it may turn out to be le less serious or it may turn out to be more serious than had uh, than the individual had anticipated. And uh, it's also important to stress that if someone does have cancer, they don't automatically die. So uh, in that sense, the, the, the need for palliative care may, may not be the, the first consideration there. Um, but I think if I've understood the point, you're making it is to, that we should be doing all that we can to ensure that when a point is reached, that the diagnosis is that, that, that the person is unlikely to uh, survive the, the, the condition, then 
we ought to be ensuring that uh, measures are put in place to have an anticipatory care plan and to have that discussion. I don't know if Professor Wright wants to, to follow up on that. Have I, have I understood correctly the point yeah. you're uh, making? My, I had a, a situation where a friend of uh, friend of mine's mother actually was diagnosed with cancer, but was told she would only live for six months, but, yeah. but lived for three years. Yeah. I had a friend who was diagnosed uh, in October of one year and died in April of the next year. Yeah. So there's a, a, a wide variation between, yeah. you know, some people uh, 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 cope with it, live with it and, and get on with it, but other, unfortunately, people uh, have a situation where they, 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 they ex you know, an express situation into palliative care. And that's the point I was trying to clarify. So, yeah, and, and, and that, uh, again, I think speaks directly to the issue of ensuring that the anticipatory clear plan is tailored to the individual. So we don't simply say a person has this condition, therefore they're likely to survive for X length of time, therefore this is what we'll do. Every individual is different. And as already mentioned, a person may have one uh, major condition, but they may have other underlying conditions that uh, affect the likelihood of um, their, their lifespan being long or short. Uh, and that's where that's where the input of the, the, the GP and other qualified uh, medical practitioners is hugely important. Before, before Professor White comes in, you know, again, the, the, my main question is, uh, we're getting told we're currently no available data on the total spent, the provision of uh, palliative and end-of-life care because of the nature of the general situation, uh, cross-cutting, utilising many geriatric uh, 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 situations. But do we honestly know, uh, or, or can you tell us, or uh, are we uh, trying to ascertain, and I think uh, Mike McKenzie was on about that earlier on, do we know what the current level of funding is required to fund palliative care uh, and end-of-life care in Scotland? What is our future prediction? Because if we are looking at this, we need to know, uh, is there sufficient funding? Uh, are people going to get the, the, the care that they deserve? And what is the what are you commissioning uh, in regards to arrangements currently in place between NHS boards and independent hospices in Scotland to do a, a wonderful job? We all know we've all attended the different events, situations. You know, mentioned all the cancer charities. You know, we've all we've all been along and, and trying to help them as much as possible. But are we actually physically well? We're tackling the problem uh, in order to through drugs, etc. To ensure people live longer, but are we really facing up to the situation that at some point we're going to have to up the funding uh, in regards to this if we don't have the correct data? Or, or you know, where are we? So, I was going to ask this point, he was going to make a, 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 an additional comment, I think, yeah. before uh, Richard or move, move, move the discussion on a little bit. So, Professor White, could you come in first? Yeah, thank you. Um, it, it was related um, to uh, M Mr Lyle's comment around um, conversations around uh, prognosis and uh, how, how long someone m might live. There, there are some interesting data um, published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2010 which showed that early consideration of, of palliative care and provision um, of palliative care um, although people received less aggressive treatments because that was not their, their wish, they actually lived uh, longer. So there, there are complex relationships um, in, in relation to um, th those, those discussions. Um, but, but again, it's important uh, uh, in terms of linking th that early consideration of palliative care with the, the more general outcomes in terms of treatment decisions, lifespan. Um, that study also showed that people were significantly less depressed um, if they had early access um, to, to palliative care. I, I'm, if I'm, I may, I could pick up on the f yeah. the, the, the yeah. funding. Um, it, one of the one of the issues, as the committee knows, is this distinction between palliative care as a general principle, as a general dimension of care provided by everyone, and specialist palliative care. We, we can describe that the funding that goes to specialist palliative care services, because those are dedicated. You have dedicated nurses and doctors. You have dedicated funding that c goes from NHS boards to hospices. 
Um, boards are also able to describe um, the funding that they're allocating to palliative care initiatives. So there's some um, wonderful work going on, for example, in NHS Lothian, where they're able to uh, describe the amount of money they're investing to promote early identification across a range of conditions, to train their clinicians in having the conversation. Um, some of the, the, the uh, the, the challenges are there are some teams who won't necessarily know what they're doing as palliative care, um, but they are focused on people's quality of life. They're having conversations about what they would like to happen, um, and and they won't recognise as this bit of the my care is palliative care. So so it's that challenge of allocating um, or describing resource to that more general provision. Um, but again, if it's helpful, we can provide the committee with, with some further information around boards and what they've been investing in. Uh, well, it said uh, that... Uh, sorry, uh, if uh, just... Like, no, just no, Richard, Mr Gray wants to come in and okay. ask it, it, was only, it was only to... I'm sure the committee remembers this, but um, you did commission a, an NHS board budget survey, and from each board, um, you've asked... One of the questions you asked was for an estimate of spending on palliative care services as defined by the Scottish Partnership for Palliative Care um, and to provide details of funding agreed by the board for hospices. So there will be there will be information in preparation for the committee which should assist in that particular aspect of the inquiry. And Richard Lyle, I am, I am going to let you back in, but I need to ask you first, is it specifically still on this? Because Dennis Roberts has been waiting patiently for a supplementary on this. Yes, I, I, I can only see statistics from 2006-07, £59 million. Pounds. Yes. What is it now? Well, when th that's why we're awaiting the responses that the boards are giving on this particular issue, because I think that will be um, the best way to determine this. We can provide more data, but as Professor White has said, there are ranges of palliative care services provided by boards which they don't define as palliative care. Um, but when, when the boards have completed their returns, um, I think the, 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 the committee will have the latest and most up-to-date evidence in front of it uh, to help it with this consideration. Thank you, Gideon. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's fair to say that Richard Lyle has hit on an important point, because when we get that data in, we need to make sure the data is actually gathered in a consistent way, because uh, we one part of the country could show a low expenditure, but they're not capturing all the, the investment spent. Another part of the country could be show significant expenditure, but they could be mopping up everything that could be remotely counted as palliative care. How can the Scottish government make sure that we can we, we, we can compare different parts of the country? Well, the, you're right to point out that there could be differences. There are no absolutes. Um, but one of the things we're, we'll be doing in the course of this year through the various um, groups that we've mentioned is to ensure that as far as possible there's consistency of definition. The other point, of course, perhaps worth making is that palliative care is not always um, a drug or an adaptation. Palliative care may be uh, someone to talk to. And, you know, without... without uh, we will absolutely, we absolutely understand the point the committee is making and we will make sure that as far as possible there is consistency. But the GP talking to the patient, the practice nurse talking to the patient is sometimes the palliative care that is needed. And, you know, the, the prospects of every such conversation always being recorded. Palliative care provided by um, voluntary sector partners, uh, palliative care provided by friends, family colleagues, all of these things come into the mix. But from the standpoint of the NHS, um, we take the committee's point that where we are providing it, and it is so categorised, it ought to be consistent. Okay, thank you, Mr Gray, and a very patient Dennis Robertson. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, just prior to uh, Mr Lyle going on to the funding, um, it was an earlier uh, response, Mr Gray, when you were really talking about the, the care uh, plan for each individual patient, and obviously it's person-centred, um, uh, and, and, and that's to be commended. When, uh, and you mentioned obviously a comor comorbidity uh, with uh, many people coming towards end of life. In respect of uh, a patient having um, a capacity issue, so if they lose the, their capacity, um, 
What support's there for the family? Because the person may have had that early conversation, may have had that early conversation, and may have expressed a wish to die at home. But because uh, they now have uh, their capacity is, is perhaps um, maybe through dementia, um, they may they may actually be saying something uh, contrary uh, to that first initial express wish. Are, do we have the the support and the um, I, I suppose the the specialism to cope with people um, in, in that area and obviously to to support the the, the carers and families. Um. So one of the uh, core elements of the GP contract is that practices are expected to have a protocol in place to identify carers, which, which again is, is supporting and, and assisting uh, w with some of the scenarios that you mentioned. Um, we've noted that um, the numbers of um, power of attorneys that are in place in, in Scotland is, has increased um, significantly over the past five years and, and again that's one of the important areas whereby um, if someone has made their wishes known before losing capacity and the power of attorneys in place uh, then care teams are able to ensure that the, the person's wishes are reflected through dialogue with, with the power of attorney. Um, in place though when say a person maybe goes into a, a care home situation or, or, or any other situation to um, advise uh, families and carers about power of attorney. I, I wonder, I wonder if I could just answer on uh, in respect of anticipatory care planning. It isn't a one-off element. That's not a one-off discussion that's had. It should be something that is ongoing and live throughout that patient clinician. Uh, interaction. So, a, a, a patient or a person can can um, develop an anticipatory care plan in discussion with their clinician, but that needs to be revisited over time. So, care planning is a, a an active uh, um, element of the care, um, checking that the plan is still uh, current, it's consistent with an individual's condition. Aware of that um, yeah. uh, aspect of the care planning, as I say, primarily through uh, David Carroll, but. My, my my concern is round about the capacity situation and how do we ensure that the initial wishes um, that a person may may have expressed uh, are followed through um, in the event that they, they lose capacity, that the family don't, in terms of the power of attorney, perhaps maybe sort of um, go down a different route. So I, th there are. Three situations, in order just to try to frame the response, Mr Robertson, three situations I can anticipate there will doubtless be more. One is where there is a clear anticipatory care plan, where it is uh, consistent with the wishes of the person uh, made when they had capacity, and therefore that's the simple situation that can be followed through. There's then the situation where the person has capacity, makes an anticipatory care plan, loses capacity and appears then to change their mind. Now, that, that's a more difficult situation because then that requires um, an assessment of whether the person's capacity is so so diminished that the change of mind uh, might be overlooked. Now, uh, uh, without going into individual cases, it's difficult to comment on how that, that might be handled. There's a third case which the person's wishes may be known by the family um, but there is no anticipatory care plan, and then the person again appears to change their mind. Now, that again would require a conversation with the family, the relevant clinicians, and as far as the person was able, the individual concerned. But you, you, there can't be a straightforward answer to your, your question, Mr Robertson, save to say that um, in every case the answer would be, as far as possible, a conversation involving all parties, recognising recognise yeah. that these situations will arise. Yes. yes. Thank you. Anyone want to add anything to that, Professor White? 
It's something that we would want to, to pick up in relation to Dr Milne's point around having that information available to, to all members of the team across all settings when there has been a change in care preference as part of the work on, on key information summaries. We had some interesting work in NHS Lothian around this point about being um, teams being able to quickly access that sort of information in terms of providing care in accordance with a preference that might have changed. Um, and the importance of that, um, because clearly clinicians need to know where to go within the system to get the information about the decision, to find out whether it's changed and to have that conversation. So it's another key part of, of having the right information available for, for the teams. OK, thank you. We have about five minutes left here th th this morning. Thanks, Dennis. Um, I had Mike's name down. I don't know if he's... Are, are you OK now, Mike? And just before I come to yourself... Uh, Richard, which I will do. Nanette Millen had indicated she might wish back in. She wanted to give you that option first. Okay. Okay. Uh, I did cut you off earlier, Dr. Simpson. I suppose we should let you in, yes, Dr. Simpson. No, no, I mean, I'll follow Nanette. Uh, did you want a question, Nanette? Yeah, Sorry. No, yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> it was just a, a connection with um, going back to the sort of cancer drugs from patients who did not get cancer drugs. You know, they were at the time. Scotland opted not to have a cancer drugs fund, which they had in England. And, and you know, it's my understanding that a number of people actually went, went from Scotland to England to access these sort of things. What's, what's the government able to do for these sort of people who did not, in fact, get these sort of drugs at the end of life? Has that, has that had any impact on the sort of palliative care and what's been done for it? And I'm, I'm aware of the changes that were made to the individual patient treat, treatment requests um, system ar around um, patients where there were requests to boards for provision of, of certain drugs. Um, I don't have the information in terms of the specific links to palliative care, but ha happy to provide you, you with that uh, as follow-up in writing. It would be quite interesting just to mm -hmm. know what actually happened. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. And um, our two Richards to close the session, Richard Simpson, first of all. Yes, one of the principles is that there should be a multidisciplinary discussion uh, in creating an anticipatory care plan. But the other side of that coin is, um, and do we have in, in, the, in the guidance the fact that there should be a single named person that should be the point of contact? Uh, because certainly in terms of my clinical experience, uh, I mean, that shouldn't necessarily be the GP, it might be the nurse, it might be the physio, it might be the OT, it might be anyone. Uh, it might even be one of the carers. But having a single person that coordinates what is often a very complex team, I mean, I've, I've had cases where I've had up to 16 different individuals involved, and giving both the patient and a named person c together a c control over a situation where control is really psychologically very important. I wonder if that is in the guidance now quite clearly. Uh, Professor White? One of the things we now do at the National Advisory Group is start every meeting with uh, a patient or relative story about care. Um, and one of the things we've heard is that relatives are saying that sometimes they are taking that role of having to coordinate the different agencies and that adds to carer burden. Um, the guidance in relation to last days and hours of life emphasises the importance of families knowing which nurse or doctor is in charge of the, the, the care. Um, in terms of um, the anticipatory care planning, I would need to check with colleagues who are working on that, but again, happy to follow that up in terms of providing the committee with assurance that that, that principle around making sure who um, should be contacted is reflected in that work. I, I agree, it's, it's crucial. Mr Gray, yes? It, it was simply to say, and, and also just in response to Dr Simpson, that principle four of the guidance is that consideration is given to the well-being of relatives and carers attending the person. And to be very simple about it, causing them to run around trying to coordinate something is not, in my view, giving due consideration to their well-being. So just to be very clear about that. OK, thank you very much for that. Uh, Richard Lyle. Uh, two comments. One, one comment is um, this morning you've, you've actually conveyed that none of us like to discuss our death, how we're going to die or when we're going to die. None of us know when we're going to die, but, you know, uh, some of us, like myself, made a will 20 years ago. My family know how I want to be buried. My family know how I want to be treated if I go into a care home. And, uh, you know, we do have to all have situations where if uh, 
some of our family or friends go into a care home and, and we're trying to get to power of attorney, it's very, very hard. But try talking to a, an 82-year-old or an 82-year-old, as I had to do, and mother in law father-in-law, and asked them how they wanted buried, and you know they didn't want to discuss it. I only discovered after one of them died how the other wished to be treated. Um, but, you know, we have to prepare. So you said earlier, Paul, that you have prepared for today's meeting. And knowing you as I do, I'm sure you are starting to prepare for what this, this uh, uh, committee is looking at. So what is the Scottish Government doing to prepare for uh, the future in palliative care? What work are you actually doing just now? So of the committee session, tell me everything the Scottish Government's doing in palliative care. Well, I think your, your time Lyle starts now. And, and we're timing you now, but okay. maybe some general comments. Mr. Mr. I think, Gray. well, I think I'll keep it very brief, and we, again, we can write to the committee in detail, but it's a very fair question. So, um, if you'd looked at the Scottish Government a couple of years ago, we wouldn't have had a national clinical lead for palliative care, nor would we have had a senior policy officer for palliative care. We've put that resource in place to ensure that we have a coordinated approach. We've set up the groups that Professor White has described. We've invested in uh, ensuring that the uh, Out of Hours review, led by Sir Lewis Ritchie, is being briefed on the issues uh, connected with this subject. Um, I'm happy to give a fuller account, but we're not simply talking about it, we're doing things about it and we're putting resource into it. I suppose one of the key things Richard Lyle is pointing out is the, the forthcoming inquiry that we have can feed into some of that work, which is what we're, we're clearly hoping for. Well, well time has, has now defeated us, but it might be worth pointing out just, just at the end of this evidence session that when scrutinising some other uh, evidence uh, a few months ago uh, at the same roundtable meeting, it was pointed out by professionals that Scotland's palliative care movement and provision is of a very high standard in comparison to, to other places, but at the same time, uh, we had to go far further. And both those things can actually be true at, at the same time. And I think it's in that uh, environment that we are keen to uh, have our inquiry um, to drive change within the sector. But I just wanted to put on record, I'm sure all the committee members do, of the exceptional job that's done day in, day out by that sector, including uh, the third sector as well. So can I thank you all uh, for your time here this morning. Your evidence has been very useful in forming our scoping exercise for the forthcoming inquiry and, as previously agreed, we will now move into private session. Thank you. <laughs>